Thank you. I think my mom would be happy to hear that. Uh, so I will tell you about nodal geometry. It's my pleasure to talk about this subject because it's kind of fun. Uh, so there are not many people who are really working in this area, and that's kind of a trouble. So I'm trying to convince more and more that it is interesting. I'll try to do it. So it's based on several joint work that I will talk right now. But I will start with a, a historical background. So there is a, a nice story where Napoleon was involved and kind of influenced research in this topic. There were physicists that were traveling through Europe and entertaining general public. And somehow this idea worked out very well and uh, Napoleon influenced research in this area. Um, so I will start with three elementary questions. What I mean is in this area, it's very easy to formulate essential difficulty in very simple and precise form where you don't need to know anything beyond undergraduate level course of I don't know, complex analysis. Uh, so basically what you do, you look at the pictures that physicists produced and uh, you ask whether true what you see with your own very eyes. Uh, then I will talk a little bit what it is about. Is it geometry? I will show you several very beautiful conjectures uh, uh, which sounds like geometrical facts, and then I will try to convince you that this is uh, actually a problem from analysis. Uh, I don't know, for me, it worked very well to have uh, intuition in complex analysis while doing partial differential equations. So not all the facts in PD are by integration by parts. And uh, at the very end, I will I think I will not get there, but there is one fact in PD where nodal geometry is useful, though it's kind of very non-standard trick, uh, which is due to Kolanadiashvili. So let me start. Um, so here are the pictures. Uh, many renowned physicists have seen the same mysterious curves that are called nodal curves. And a node means just a knot, and uh, you can see some kind of nodes on those pictures. And it's very unfortunate name. Usually like if you take a mathematical object, you will see just curves without almost no intersections if you don't have some kind of symmetry. Uh, so what's happening here, it's a resonance experiment. You have a metal piece of a plate, so a square shaped, and uh, it resonates with some kind of frequency. And you can visualize it how it vibrates by putting sand on top of it. So uh, when the plate vibrates and there is a sand on top of it, it goes up and down, but there are some lines where the amplitude is zero and the sand accumulates along these lines. And those lines are called nodal curves. Uh, uh, almost two ages ago, um, Napoleon Bonaparte, he was visiting uh, a meeting of French Academy of Sciences and uh, he has seen this experiment and he was so impressed that he proposed to uh, mathematicians to explain what is happening there. And uh, the French Academy of Sciences sets an award and for this prize and the consensus began, but it didn't finish. So there was a very substantial progress due to Sophie Germain with a lot of help from Lagrange. And what she did, she basically derived the equation which describes uh, what are those mysterious curves. Unfortunately, it's not the equation that you can solve explicitly. And yeah, some kind of equation that describes formally as an object, but does not give you immediate intuition. Why does it look like it is on the pictures? Uh, there are also like some struggles in this approach. Uh, I think it was a, a kind of dirty story that I won't talk about, but uh, now we know due to Sophie Germain that we just need to study zero sets of special solutions to differential equations. 
Uh, then people tried to say more. It appeared very soon that, okay, in some particular cases with a lot of symmetry, like if you have a perfect round plate, you can separate variables and say everything that you want to say, what is visible on the picture. Uh, but to complete understanding, we did not arrive so far. So uh, here is it. So what do you see in the case of a vibrating metal plate? You see zero sets of solution to the force or the differential equation. So those are uh, eigenfunctions of the Bylaplace operator and the, you look at zero sets. And total sets are just a fancy name that physicists invented and it's not really good. Uh, this is a harder problem. Usually people talk about a simpler problem uh, which concerns second order equation. Uh, so zero sets of Laplace eigenfunctions, which is related to two other physical problems. In particular, if you have not a metal plate, but some kind of thin material, like a vibrating elastic membrane, then the equation describing its vibrations is simpler. Uh, and in the second case, you can say more, and the first problem is harder. Uh, and uh, a very interesting problem is to understand the behavior of the eigenfunctions as the frequency goes to infinity. And we are stuck there, though we study only zeros there. So uh, what are Laplace eigenfunctions? Uh, uh, it's a good question. So one simple example to keep in mind, uh, it's the torus and it tells you that you can think about trigonometric polynomials of uh, several variables. In one dimensional case, like Laplace eigenfunctions, they are just sines and cosines and you can see like the argument kx and you increase k and you see that uh, the higher the frequency, the more zeros the eigenfunction has. Uh, and the situation becomes more difficult um, in higher dimensions, especially when you cannot separate variables. Okay, here is a, uh, actually example, which, is, uh, which seems to be easy, but it's already interesting enough. And Jean Bourguin and Zeev Rudny had a lot of fun studying just two-dimensional torus. So here you can write the basis of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions, but what you see here that eigenvalues sometimes have a multiplicity bigger than one. There are several functions which satisfy this equation. And uh, I don't know, when people talk about eigenfunctions, they mean different things. Sometimes it's just solution to a PDE, some, sometimes uh, it has a different meaning, uh, but for this talk, just think about solutions to PD. And here, you don't impose any boundary conditions. It's uh, and the simple separation of variables gives you products of signs. And the, a complicated thing that you can do just take linear combinations of these things, and then uh, uh, things become more interesting. How do you study linear combinations of those guys? First, which is um, easy to check that linear combinations satisfy this PD, so they have a structure, but you don't know explicitly the coefficient. It could be anything, any linear combination. In particular, it's interesting to take some random combination of simple uh, I don't know, spherical harmonics or eigenfunction on the torus. Let me show you another example. Um, here is a, a picture by a student of Peter Sarnak. Uh, what you see here is the value distribution of uh, a spherical harmonic. So on a two-dimensional sphere, okay, you can uh, speak about eigenfunctions in a different way. So you can identify them with uh, 
harmonic polynomials in a three-dimensional space. If you have a homogeneous polynomial, homogeneous harmonic polynomial, its values are uniquely defined by its restriction to the two sphere. And the, then you may just study uh, the homogeneous harmonic polynomials in three-dimensional space. And here is uh, its value distribution on the sphere. And uh, it's a reflected picture. So if the spherical harmonic has like negative function, we don't want to put it inside of the sphere. We reflected it here. And you can see a lot of, uh, I would say, structure and case at the same time. Uh, you can argue that uh, Laplace eigenfunctions in some sense are analog of polynomials and this intuition um, works very well. Uh, and the, the eigenvalue, I can think about that as an analog of the degree of a polynomial. In this case, again, the space of uh, Laplace eigenfunctions of a given degree is kind of very, very high. And on the picture here, you see like a random spherical harmonic of degree 14. Uh, and what you can do here, you can ask questions coming directly from the picture. I formulated three of them. Uh, so each of them takes one line to formulate. Uh, imagine uh, that you're given a sequence of eigenfunctions and uh, you know that eigenvalue grows to infinity. And uh, you are interested in some quantitative properties. Like, for instance, you can try to count the number of local minimums and local maximums uh, on the picture. And uh, Yao first conjectured that the number of this uh, local maximums and local minimums should grow to infinity. It should be related to the degree. And this question is a simple question about polynomials. And this is a hard question. And you don't know the answer to that. Peter Sarnak was interested in a different aspect, like how high are the hills on this picture? So you see this kind of spikes. Uh, it's not clear how, how large they are. So, and for some practical reasons, the standard basis of spherical harmonics, which comes from separation of variables, is not good enough because it's L infinity norm is huge compared to L2 norm. It's not like sine or cosine, which is just oscillating but keeps being flat. No. And people tried to find a better basis, uh, which is flat in the sense that. Uh, each element in the basis is trying to be as regular as possible. And Peter Sarnak conjectured that on a two-dimensional sphere, there is no nice way to choose a basis of spherical harmonic if you're interested in their L infinity norm. We cannot make them flat. Uh, so in both of these questions, what we re really mean that there is a lower bound that does not depend on a specific eigenfunction, which, which depends only on the eigenvalue. Like the number of critical points could be estimated like by some power of lambda and the L infinity norm should be estimated by some logarithmic of lambda from below. And there is um, the third thing, okay, it's called, uh, it's tough. This third question is related to ratio between uh, the blue and red areas on the picture. So the total amount of positive area should be comparable to the total amount of the area where the eigenfunction is negative. And maybe it will actually tend to one. We know that it cannot go to zero to infinity, but we expect that it goes to one. Uh, yeah, that's what I mentioned before. It's known due to Donnelly and Pfefferman. It was uh, a question on a two-dimensional sphere, which was asked by David Armitage and Stephen Gardiner, whether you have a kind of a quasi-symmetry on the sphere, whether this ratio is bounded. And Donnelly and Pfefferman, they 
invented a time machine, traveled back in time 10 years and asked the question 10 years before it was posed. And uh, their approach, it was working for all uh, algebraic situation, moreover, all real analytic Riemannian metrics. So if the Riemannian metric is given a local coordinate by nice, infinitely differentiable functions, which are represented by okay, with real analytic coefficients, then this fact holds and uh, they explain to the world how to connect complex analysis to, to this problem. Though this problem is entirely real. When I talk about eigenfunctions and the zero sets, I always mean that we consider only real solutions and real zero sets. Uh, and uh, there is a recent work that's, okay, so it's just a generalization to, uh, to the smooth case, but what is really new and what we observed is that the quasi-symmetry holds on small scales, something like lambda to the power minus one over four. So there is, if you take uh, any ball of radius lambda to the power minus one fourth on the sphere. So, okay, you take a spherical harmonic of very, very uh, high degree and uh, you see that its sine oscillates a lot and you can see that the distribution of sine is uh, kind of symmetric on, on a shrinking scale. Like you can take a tiny ball start zooming and you will still see there a lot of positive and negative area. And uh, we don't know what is the right scale and in our approach, it looks like lambda to the power of minus one fourth. And uh, if you start to zoom in further, then you, okay, quasi symmetry will break at some moment. And we don't know at which scale it breaks, but um, it's, expected, uh, oh, we don't know even know at which scale we expect it to break. Okay, uh, let me tell you some nice theorems because they are very universal and easily to formulate. So actually the, a lot of attention to this problem uh, was drawn due to a very simple and very entertaining theorem by Kurens. So it tells you that if you order the eigenfunctions in the increasing order of the eigenvalues, then the case eigenfunction uh, has at most k nodal domains. Uh, in particular, in those pictures that I've seen before, you can bound the number of nodal curves. Uh, it may happen that there is a high multiplicity and in that case you can choose uh, uh, eigenfunctions in any order that you like. Like for instance, uh, on the sphere, yeah, you, like the eigenfunctions corresponding to the second, third and fourth, they have, a, uh, they're the same and uh, they have at most two nodal domains, like x. Um, later, people thought that actually the number of nodal domains or the number of nodal curves should grow to infinity as the degree increases. And uh, two students of Richard Kuren, so it was probably the first and probably the last student with a 50 age difference, they attacked this problem and they both constructed examples um, of eigenfunctions with very high eigenvalue, like arbitrary high, which have only two nodal domains, as you can see on the picture. Uh, you can ask different questions about nodal sets. Uh, and uh, for instance, you can ask what kind of topological behavior you could expect. And uh, on one hand, like every topological configuration is possible. But uh, if you fix a degree like of a spherical harmonic and you like say call it n and then you would like to know how many loops uh, can be there, 
then the answer is we don't know. So, and it's probably as hard as a Hilbert problem of describing uh, the number of curves for polynomials on the plane of specific degree. So it's closely related. Uh, so uh, I wanted to mention that in this area, many of the effects, they are local. And if you want to apply them, lo local effects are more useful than the global ones. And uh, you can take a smaller ball on your Riemannian manifold and you can ask how many nodal domains fit in into a given ball of some radius r and you would like to uh, get the answer in terms of the radius of the ball or in terms of the volume. Uh, and roughly what you get is, uh, okay, so the current theorem tells us that if you consider the total number of nodal domains on the whole manifold, then the case eigenfunction has at most k nodal domain. And when you take a smaller ball, then what you get at first approximation is k times the ratio of the volumes, uh, the volume of the ball and the volume of the manifold. Um, and I probably forgot to write here a constant. You, you have a, a bound with where you involve ratio for. So it kind of tells us that you expect some kind of equidistribution, that there couldn't be a lot of nodal domains concentrating near one specific point, like a northern pole that they like more. And uh, there is some correction term. So there is a term which is not linear in K, some power of K, which depends on the dimension. And uh, here is an example. So it's, okay, nodal curve. So the word nodal comes from the, the word nodes. So yeah, this is some kind of intersection of several nodal curves. And it's a very interesting question, how many nodal curves can intersect at one point? And there could be many, uh, roughly square root of lambda. Uh, or if you talk in terms of, uh, degree. Um, okay, so here is a, a, an example. You have a homogeneous harmonic polynomial of degree n, and you're restricted to the sphere, and its zero set is a union of n circles, and all of them intersect at the northern pole. Uh, and uh, the eigenvalue that corresponds to to this n is roughly n square and the square root of lambda is roughly the same as n and it's roughly the same as the number of nodal curves that intersect at one point. Uh, and uh, if you take say a ball of some small radius with center at the northern pole, then no matter what is the radius, the number of nodal curves intersecting in this will be the same as n. So this is roughly why you have this correction term and you can think about high dimensions and there is a reasonable answer there. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about the proofs. I don't have uh, much time for that. And uh, uh, there is a, a variational method in PD that people like to use a lot. And current theorem is one page proof is using the variational method and then uh, when you try to do a local statement, it doesn't work at all and it's a completely different problem. You think in terms of uh, quantitative properties and it's more related to complex analysis than to variational methods. Uh, and when you try to answer that, you may uh, Think about nodal domains, about nodal curves, why they cannot be very long and narrow, why they cannot accumulate at one specific place. Uh, so there are different uh, tools that are used, but all of them can be called uh, uh, tools from analysis, though geometrical intuition helps here a lot. So here is one very helpful object, which is called harmonic measure. and. Uh, this ingredient 
tells us that if you have like a very narrow and long nodal domain, if you have two nodal curves that are very, very close, then eigenfunction should grow extremely fast there. And there is another ingredient which tells us that in some way you control the behavior of eigenfunctions. You can control the growth in terms of the eigenvalue, and you can think about that as of analog of the statement that if you have a polynomial, then you can control its growth in terms of degree, and there are millions of inequalities for polynomials of a given degree. And you can ask the same question for eigenfunctions. So you take a theorem about polynomials, like some kind of estimate for de derivative and infinity norm or some uniform norm, and uh, you, okay, you can get an open question there easily. Um, and uh, this new ingredient, it, it's in some sense, uh, it is using the global, it's not a local statement, you use some global information that the function is living on the whole manifold. Otherwise, like if you don't impose any boundary conditions and you look at some uh, solution to PT, then, um, uh, things could be arbitrary wild as you'd like. Uh, and uh, okay, you don't need to know what is BMO here, but let me roughly state uh, in a different language what the new ingredient tells us. The eigenfunctions with uh, eigenvalue lambda, they behave like polynomials of degree square root of lambda. And please ignore the inequality in the lower part of the slide. It's just quantitative version of say something about growth of eigenfunctions that they behave like polynomials. Uh, and it's, I must say that uh, there was, okay, Donnelly and Pfefferman, they did a lot of research in this area and they brought amazing ideas. But there was a different approach, which was uh, basically, okay, Alandis asked several intriguing questions, which appear to be closely related to what Donald and Pfefferman were doing. And Kolana Dirashvili had amazing ideas how to attack this problem from a different point of view. Um, okay, so uh, let me mention another fact, which is another analogy. So another analog of the statement that eigenfunctions behave like polynomials of certain degree. So we know like a fact, a fundamental fact of algebra, so if you have a, a complex plane and if you have a polynomial of degree n, then it has n roots. And here is an analog of it. You calculate the total surface, okay, the total, uh, area of the nodal set. Again, okay, if you are living on a two-dimensional surface, just calculate the lengths of the nodal set and the, the lengths should be comparable to the square root of lambda. It, there should be a lower and upper bound uh, for the lengths of nodal sets of eigenfunctions in terms of the eigenvolume. And the, this conjecture was motivated by a fact which is like two lines to prove. Uh, and the fact says that the nodal sets of the eigenfunctions, it is very dense, like it's C over square root of lambda dense, which means that for every point of the manifold, you can find a point from the nodal set, from the zero set, which is close, C over square root of lambda close. And when lambda goes to infinity, it becomes uniformly dense, more and more dense. Uh, and looking at this fact that you see more and more nodal sets, you may guess that the total length of nodal sets should grow to infinity. And if you are in high dimensional setting, uh, n dimensional manifold, then nodal sets are n minus one dimensional surfaces. And you can ask what is their n minus one dimensional volume and it's conjectured that it's comparable to square root of lambda. This conjecture is closely related to a quasi-symmetry conjecture that which says that the total amount of uh, 
white and black on the picture, the total area of the set where eigenfunction is positive is comparable to the total volume of the set where the eigenfunction is negative. If you can prove Yau's conjecture, you can prove a quasi-symmetry conjecture. One implies another. Uh, there has been a lot of work here. Let me just mention that all these facts are proved due to Donnelly and Pfefferman in the case when you have the sphere, and it's already extremely interesting situation. Uh, there are a lot of ideas coming from different people, and I don't think I have uh, time to cover all of them. Uh, uh, let me mention what kind of advances we have now. So now we know that the lower bounds is true in all dimensions as it was expected. For the upper bound, it's still a challenge even in dimension two. Uh, though in dimension two, there are a lot of tools and in dimension higher than two, uh, there is a polynomial bound but we don't know how to push it to something. Okay, it's relatively explicit, but uh, constants are really bad and we don't know like effective way how to push it to optimal one. In dimension two, I'm kind of more optimistic that you can get to one half. Um, and uh, here is a borderline case where we know what is happening and uh, it's a nice thing. So if you work in the Euclidean space, say you have some domain with some smooth boundary and um, you consider a sequence of eigenfunctions in this domain, those are kind of special functions which vanish on the boundary, but you look at their zero set inside. And uh, you can also measure the length or the n minus one dimensional volume of the zero set. And it should also be comparable to the square root of lambda. And uh, this is true. We know now that this is true. And this problem is kind of in between two settings. Uh, so you live in the Euclidean space. It's extremely nice Euclidean metric, but the boundary of the domain is allowed to be smooth and you don't assume no real analyticity. In this case, you can tell everything about the uh, length of the zero set of eigenfunctions. Uh, okay, so here is the last thing that I wanted to mention. So uh, as I mentioned in this area, you can formulate the main difficulty in a very short form. And here is a question of Colin and Dirashvili, I don't know, uh, maybe in mathematics, people become very snobbish when they see a simple question. They don't think that it's a good question, but this one was a really good one. And let's formulate it the following way. So if you have a, a non-constant harmonic function in a three-dimensional Euclidean space, uh, then its zero set is uh, a two-dimensional set, so a union of surfaces. And Nadirashvili, he asked whether the total area of this guy is infinite. So you can easily imagine a surface, okay, some kind of cusp which goes to infinity, which has a finite area. So zero, okay, if you have a, a harmonic function, which is not constant, it has at least one zero. So this is the Liouville theory. And Nadirashvili's question was, uh, the elaboration of it and he asked whether its zero set is huge in some sense. And later it appeared that uh, yeah it's true and there are also kind of universal bounds for this statement. So if you take a unit ball and uh, you know that harmonic function is zero at the center of the unit ball, then in this ball you have a universal lower bound from below. Uh, and uh, there is scaled version of this statement. Okay, you can replace a ball of radius one by a ball of radius r, and then what do you have? Um, you have a bound which explodes, and which becomes bigger and bigger than the larger r is. And 
you can let r go to infinity and uh, see that the total area is infinite. So uh, this question is as uh, hard as uh, lower bound in Yao's conjecture. And uh, there is a very simple trick how to relate one question to another. And it's called the harmonic lift. Basically, if you have eigenfunction, then you can cook up a harmonic function out of it, just adding extra variables and, and uh, multiplying the old eigenfunction by exponent, which depends on new variable t. And here is a specific example. Yeah, you have eigenfunction phi, you have a harmonic function. OK, it's actually not visible at the moment, but it's kind of true by calculation that eigenfunction multiplied by specific exponent appears to be a harmonic function on the product uh, manifold. And the, you can see that the harmonic function, the new harmonic function that you obtained, its zero set is a cylinder over the zero set of an eigenfunction. And then you can transfer information about zero sets of harmonic function to the information about zero sets of eigenfunctions. And uh, what you can see here immediately, like this harmonic function, it's growing exponentially in one of the directions. And, uh, and the bigger the lambda, the faster it grows. Uh, and what happens when you try to study zero sets, you start arguing in terms of growth or in terms of the thing which is called frequency. Uh, and uh, try to understand the behavior of the zero sets in terms of uh, draws. And the answer is, yeah, there is a direct relation. You can tell how the zero set is uh, large in terms of the growth of the function. And it's, again, some kind of analog of of the statement that a polynomial of degree n on the complex plane has exactly n rules. I think this is all I can say at the moment. So it's a long talk. And I want to thank you and wish you to have a great summer. That's all we desire for.